Welcome, esteemed colleagues and passionate minds. Today we delve into the enigma that has shaped our very understanding of the cosmos, Einstein's theory of relativity. We aim to dissect its intricacies, challenge its precepts, and perhaps emerge anew with our comprehension of reality. Let's begin by introducing ourselves. Amelia, would you start? Delighted how. I'm Amelia, a theoretical physicist, and as someone who spends her time with equations revealing the universe's secrets, the relativistic framework is my playground. I'm Lenny, an astrophysicist. I must say, theories are charming, Amelia, but observing the cosmos is where true understanding unfolds. Excellent. Izzy? With pleasure. Izzy here, applied mathematician. Whether in the abstract realm or grounding theory in reality, mathematicians carve the path to clarity. Lenny's observations need the language of maths to be deciphered, after all. And I'm Jazz, the experimenter among you dreamers. Let's not forget that without experimental validation, those lovely theories might as well be science fiction. Quite right, Jazz. Mick here. Quantum physics is where I dwell, trying to reconcile the stubborn puzzle of quantum mechanics with the elegance of relativity, a task that has humbled greater minds than ours. Now that we are all acquainted, it is paramount to acknowledge the depth and complexity of the subject we are about to discuss. Our collective aim is to dissect Einstein's masterpiece while being candid in our discourse. Indeed, and while our fields may differ, we stand united in our quest for understanding. We sometimes forget that each of our perspectives is crucial to glimpsing the bigger picture. Unity doesn't preclude us from a good argument, though. There is much to debate, especially when entering the brambled woods of relativity. Absolutely. Challenge breeds progress. Let us not shy from the heat of disagreement. It often forges the sharpest insights. Then let us hope today's discourse brings such clarity. I look forward to the sparks that might fly from the collision of our varied intellects. Sparks will indeed fly, Izzy. The theory of relativity challenges the very foundation of classical mechanics and quantum physics. A debate is not just expected, it's required. Let's venture forth then. With the stage set, Let's unravel the profound implications of special relativity and the fabric of our universe. Let's dive right in. Amelia, describe to us the backbone of special relativity. How did Einstein's vision of the space-time continuum shift our understanding? Einstein completely transformed our perspective by uniting space and time. Before him, we thought in absolute terms, space was just a stage. But he posited that time is a dimension intertwining with space, creating a four-dimensional fabric, the space-time continuum. Sure, but that's the poetry of it. The real punch comes from the way it affects measurements. Let's not forget, space and time are perceived differently by observers in relative motion, which is what the Lorentz transformations account for. Exactly, jazz. Those equations demonstrate that time isn't as rigid as once believed. It's malleable and it dilates. Length contracts and mass increases as objects move closer to the speed of light. That's only part of the story, though. Many disregard the sheer absurdity. There's no common persisting now. Simultaneity is a casualty of relativity. It's baffling but fundamental. Absurdity or not, it's been confirmed experimentally. Turns out, the universe doesn't care much for our common sense. Right, and these aren't just theoretical quirks. They have practical implications that challenge our preconceived notions of time as a constant. Although, it's important to recognize that Lorentz himself had explanations for his transformations without needing to invoke space-time as Einstein did, which had its own problems initially. That may be so, but Einstein's narrative is what led us to a cohesive theory that encompasses these bizarre effects. Agreed. But I must stress, without the concept of an invariant speed of light, none of this would hold up. That's the real pillar of special relativity, isn't it? Indeed, Mick. The speed of light being the same for all observers is what locks in the relativistic nature of time and space, a pillar, unquestionably. It's a titanic shift from Newtonian absolutes, sure, but the elegance lies in its simplicity. The universe is not bound by human intuition. Let's not get carried away with simplicity. The ramifications are complex and far from intuitive, particularly when you start considering the effects at relativistic speeds. A solid start to unraveling the intricacies of relativity. 
we're scratching the surface of how deeply Einstein's principles reshaped physics. So let's pivot to the remarkable concept of general relativity. Lenny, enlighten us on the interplay between gravity and the curvature of space-time. Well, what Einstein did was discard the Newtonian notion of a gravitational force acting at a distance. Instead, mass determines the curvature of space-time, like a heavy ball on a trampoline. This curvature dictates the motion of objects, bending their paths as if they were simply following the natural contours of the universe. That's a vivid picture, Lenny, but we shouldn't ignore the complexity of the math behind this curvature. It's not just any shape. The exact geometric form is described by the Einstein field equations, the central piece of general relativity. Indeed, these equations changed our approach to physics. But don't you think there's a tendency to oversimplify space-time as a two-dimensional fabric? The reality is it's a four-dimensional construct that's incredibly challenging to visualize. Exactly, Mick. And that's where many get it wrong when they talk about gravity. They miss out on the chaotic beauty of it. It's not just about an apple falling from a tree. It's about how the tree, the apple, and the ground beneath are all part of a cosmic dance directed by the curvature of space-time. I agree with Jazz here. This redefinition means that falling objects aren't being pulled by a force. They're following the straightest possible path in a curved space-time which is a radical departure from the classical thinking. A good point, Amelia, but we should also consider the implications for cosmic scales. This isn't just about falling apples, it's about the dance of galaxies, the bending of light, and the expansion of the universe itself. And it's this large-scale structure that really tests the limits of general relativity. When we look at the behavior of galaxies and the movements of clusters, we see that space-time isn't just curved, it's dynamic, changing with the distribution of mass and energy. Fascinating. But let's not forget that this elegant geometric description of gravity by general relativity is frustratingly at odds with quantum mechanics. How space-time behaves at the quantum level is still a puzzle. It's more than a puzzle, Mick. It's a direct challenge to our understanding of physics. We've got this incredible theory that describes the cosmos at large, yet it can't reconcile with the equally true but conflicting principles governing the subatomic world. And that's the frontier, isn't it? The search for a deeper theory that can encompass both the quantum and the cosmological. General relativity is not the end. It's a stepping stone to something more profound. Indeed, the conversation about the curvature of space-time naturally steers us toward the unknown. Thank you all for such a vibrant discussion. We've touched on some of the universe's deepest mysteries, and our quest to understand them continues. We've touched the surface of time dilation before, but let's delve deeper with the intriguing twin paradox. Mick, can you kick us off on this? Certainly. Imagine identical twins, one traveling on a spaceship at near light speed, the other staying on Earth. Upon return, the traveling twin will have aged less than their Earth-bound sibling. It stems from time dilation in special relativity. That's a captivating thought experiment, but the real kicker is that it's not just theoretical. It represents how time isn't absolute, a core principle of relativity. Hold on. We must clarify. It's the acceleration and deceleration that breaks the symmetry here. The traveling twin feels the forces, whereas the stay-at-home twin does not. Exactly, Jazz. That's a critical distinction. It shows that the effects of time dilation aren't symmetrical as some initially think. Then we're on the same page that accelerated motion influences time experience differently than uniform motion. Affirmative. But let's remember, all motion is relative. The true mind-bender is that from the perspective of the traveling twin, it's the Earth that's moving. But Lenny, therein lies the paradox. If all motion is relative, why doesn't the Earth-bound twin also age less from the traveler's perspective? It's because of general relativity, which the traveling twin cannot ignore due to acceleration. And that's the crucial point. There's no ambiguity when gravity, or acceleration, 
thanks to the equivalence principle, enters the equation. This is the elegance of relativity. It reconciles what seems subjective and contextual with consistent universal laws. Elegant, Amelia, but incomplete. We've observed particles exhibiting time dilation, yet the twin paradox with humans remains untested on that scale. We're extrapolating with caution here. It's a fair distinction, but the theory is robust. We're confident because of the overwhelming indirect evidence supporting it. I think this illustrates the beauty and rigor of physics. Hypothetical scenarios that one day could very well be concrete experimentations. The equation E equals MC cured is elegantly simple, yet it has profound implications. It bridges the concepts of mass and energy, which until Einstein's time were viewed as completely distinct. And to think about it, the energy from the sun that sustains life on Earth and the destructive power of nuclear weapons both are phenomena that spring from that same equation. That's true, but the real kicker is how mass itself can be converted to energy. It's not just theoretical. The implications are vast, but isn't it somewhat discomforting? The idea that all matter essentially has this immense energy locked inside. It challenges our sense of the stability of matter. Discomforting? Maybe. But it's the reality of the universe we live in. It's elegant physics, and it's been proven empirically time and time again. However, let's remember, it's also what triggers the most violent events in the universe. Supernovae, the death throes of massive stars, are also playing with the same set of rules provided by EMC squared. Violent, but also creators. Those supernovae are where the elements we are made of get forged. In destruction, there's creation. This equation encompasses that duality. Duality, yes, but significance goes beyond stars and weapons. It has practical applications today, especially in medicine. Without that equation, we wouldn't have treatments like radiation therapy. And in speaking of practical applications, Mick, could you elaborate on how E equal C2 might relate to energy conservation and perhaps renewable sources? Well, how? Energy conservation is a fundamental principle, but E equal C2 exposes that energy can take forms we might not traditionally account for solar panels, wind turbines, they're tapping into the energy portion. But imagine if we could harness mass as a direct energy source. Harness mass directly. That's a bit far-fetched with our current technology, isn't it? Let's stay grounded. Today's renewable technologies aren't yet exploiting mass in the sense Einstein laid out. Far-fetched, perhaps, but theory often precedes application. Who knows what the distant future may hold? I think Mick has a point. Speaking of theory and application, what are your thoughts on the implications this has on the nature of mass itself? Mass is not just a measure of the amount of matter. E equals MC2 shows us that mass is a highly concentrated form of energy. It's revolutionary. I speculate that as we dig deeper into particle physics, we might uncover new ways that mass and energy interact. There is still so much we don't truly understand. That's certainly a tantalizing thought. As this segment wraps up, let us acknowledge the power of Einstein's equation that continues to spark such dynamic discussions and challenge our understanding of the universe. As we delve into the experimental confirmations of relativity, it's pivotal to discuss the historic experiments that lent credence to these ideas. Lenny, would you get us started on that? Indeed. The 1919 solar eclipse experiment spearheaded by Sir Arthur Eddington is a keystone. It confirmed the bending of light around the sun as predicted by Einstein, revolutionizing our understanding of gravity and space-time. While Eddington's observations were groundbreaking, we must not forget that subsequent experiments have refined these measurements with far greater precision. The bending of light is now an established fact, making it a mundane, albeit essential, aspect of general relativity. Mundane hardly does justice to the complexities involved in these tests. The Gravity Probe B mission, with its gyroscopes for example, measured the geodetic effect and frame dragging with remarkable precision. True, but let's acknowledge the gravity of the situation, pun intended. All the precision in the world doesn't detract from the fact that these phenomena were, once upon a time, mere theoretical predictions. Without empirical evidence, they would have remained just that. Amelia, the empirical route is indeed the only way to go. 
It's through these rigorous tests that we've seen the robustness of relativity. And speaking of robustness, the confirmation of gravitational waves just a few years ago, that was nothing short of spectacular. Decades of disbelief were quashed in a single observation. It's not just celestial events. Global positioning systems are a practical example of relativity's everyday validation. Without correcting for both general and special relativity, GPS would be off by kilometers. Izzy, your point highlights a critical aspect of experimental evidence. It is ubiquitous. Our entire satellite infrastructure depends on it. Yet there is a frontier where Einstein's relativity meets quantum mechanics. And there, my friends, we face a discord that experiments like the Large Hadron Collider are only beginning to broach. A necessary tension indeed. The marriage of the very large and the very small remains one of the most compelling challenges in modern physics. Black holes, the ultimate prediction of general relativity. A point of no return, where space and time as we understand them cease to exist. Amelia, can you expand on the role of singularities and event horizons in this context? Singularities are where our laws of physics break down. Density becomes infinite. It's the heart of a black hole. The event horizon, on the other hand, is the surrounding boundary beyond which nothing can escape the gravitational pull, not even light. But that's, that's purely theoretical. We've got no way of seeing what's inside an event horizon. The singularity, it might as well be fiction until we can observe it. Fiction? Hawking radiation suggests that black holes aren't completely black. They emit this radiation due to quantum effects near the event horizon. That's an indirect yet powerful clue that there's more to the story. True, but Hawking radiation is incredibly weak, impossible to observe with our current technology. How can you hail that as strong evidence? Because it's a logical consequence of the laws we know. And those laws have held up remarkably well under other extreme conditions. You're both right to some degree. While it's indeed hard to observe, the consistency of Hawking's predictions with other aspects of quantum theory lends credibility to his model. Then what about the information paradox? Mick, you've dabbled in quantum physics. If nothing escapes a black hole, what happens to the information contained within it? That's one of the greatest puzzles, Hal. It challenges the foundation of quantum mechanics, which says information can't be lost. There are theories, like the holographic principle, but nothing concrete yet. Consider this. Black holes are not only about destruction. The information paradox could lead us to new physics. They could be a bridge to understanding quantum gravity. That's wildly speculative. We can't start considering theories without any real empirical backup. But we must speculate, Jazz. It's speculation that drives our theories forward, leading us to new experiments and new discoveries. Speculation must be disciplined. We need observations, like the Event Horizon Telescope imaging the shadow of a black hole, to guide us. OK, that was a triumph for general relativity. I'll concede that. Seeing the shadow was like seeing the invisible. An excellent point, Jazz. The conversation illustrates the importance of black holes in testing the limits of our understanding of the universe. They remain one of the most mysterious and exciting frontiers in physics. Let's turn our attention now to gravitational lensing. The bending of light by gravity is not just a novel concept, but a critical piece of evidence for general relativity. Izzy, perhaps you could start us off with the basics? Certainly. Gravitational lensing occurs when a massive object like a galaxy or a cluster of galaxies bends the light from objects behind it. This effect confirms that mass indeed warps the fabric of space-time, as general relativity predicts. That's true, Izzy. And it's more than just a party trick of the universe. It's a tool. We've used lensing to map dark matter and to measure the mass of galaxies and clusters beyond what we can see. It goes to show how beautifully general relativity works on cosmic scales. But let me push back on the point about precise measurements. It's a tough business making those deductions. Lensing is complex. We have to rely on models, assumptions. Yes, and those assumptions can lead us astray. Take the cosmological constant, Einstein's so-called biggest blunder. For decades, we thought space was static, but now we know it's expanding. 
these things affect lensing observations. True, jazz, but without those models, we wouldn't have come as far. Gravitational lensing was key in revealing the accelerating expansion of the universe, which leads us into dark energy territory. Certainly a critical discovery, but there's more to the story. We often simplify the concept of space-time bending light, but in reality, the interaction is highly complex. The assumptions we make now may very well be the blunder we talk about in the future. Aggressive stance, Mick, but science is iterative. We make hypotheses, test them, refine them, a dance between theory and observation. Gravitational lensing serves as a profound interaction between light and gravity that we simply can't ignore in either astronomy or cosmology. Don't get me wrong, Lenny, the dance is vital, but we must remember the steps are not as definitive as we might like. Observational evidence can be messy, and gravitational lensing is no exception. Messy or not, it's indisputable that these observations have fundamentally changed our understanding of the universe. Without the bending of light by gravity, so much of what we now understand about the cosmos would still be obscured. A spirited discussion as always. It's clear that gravitational lensing is a topic that lights a fire under all of you, with good reason. It's at the heart of observing the universe's most massive and mysterious phenomena. As we delve into the practical applications of relativity, GPS technology stands out. Mick, your thoughts on how relativity plays a key role in the precision of these systems? Absolutely, Hal. General relativity isn't just theoretical. It's a cornerstone of GPS functionality. The satellite clocks are faster than those on Earth, meaning we have to adjust for time dilation, otherwise your GPS would be off by kilometers. It's not only general relativity, though. Special relativity comes into play as well due to the relative motion between satellites and receivers. We're integrating complex relativistic equations into everyday technology. And to think people doubted Einstein, not only was he correct, but without his insights, our modern world would literally lose its way. But let's be clear, the adjustments for relativity in GPS are minute. They're essential, yes, but they don't necessarily scream out the dramatic effects of relativity. Minute Amelia, I'd hardly call daily corrections of microseconds trivial when it comes down to missile systems and aviation safety. Actually, Amelia has a point. Without the right algorithms accounting for relativity, the system could still work, just with less accuracy. However, I must emphasize that the engineering challenges to incorporate these adjustments are non-trivial. Challenges, yes, but let's be honest. This is a testament to the precision of our technology and our understanding of physics. The intersection is fascinating. Intriguing, but are we overstating the case? Yes, relativity is embedded within the system, but it's largely automated. The engineers who designed it aren't necessarily pondering the nature of space-time. Oh, but they should, Lenny. Understanding the foundation of the technology brings a deeper appreciation of its operation. Then there's the argument, if most users even ought to worry about the intricacies of relativity when using GPS. It works. That's what matters to them. That's short-sighted, Hal. The success of the GPS system invites us to look closer at relativity to see where else we might apply it. It's fascinating if you think about it. The reach of Einstein's theory into practical engineering. There's a beautiful symmetry there. Sure, there's symmetry but don't forget the inconsistencies it has unearthed. The more we apply relativity, the more we realize what we don't know. Jazz is right. Instead of sitting comfortably with our achievements, we should keep probing the extremes of the theory. It's this balance between application and theory that makes relativity so relevant to our understanding of the universe. Even in something as mundane as GPS, the echoes of the cosmos are present. Now we venture into a territory where giants of physics tread lightly, where the robust fabric of general relativity seems to fray, its interplay with quantum mechanics. Amelia, how do we even begin reconciling these two pillars of modern science? Well, Hal, Einstein spent a significant part of his later years on this very problem. The key conflict is at the very heart of general relativity, the smooth space-time manifold, which clashes with the discrete, probabilistic nature of quantum mechanics. Yes, and I might add,
quantum mechanics has been suspiciously silent about gravity. We can't ignore that. Quantum field theory has no problem with other forces, but when it comes to gravity, it's like putting a square peg in a round hole. It's a bit more nuanced than that, Mick. The issue isn't just that quantum mechanics ignores gravity. It fundamentally can't account for it, not without a quantum theory of gravity to unify the two. And mathematically speaking, reconciling a smooth continuum with a probabilistic quantized framework is non-trivial. The infinities that emerge aren't just computational annoyances, they hint at a deeper incompatibility. Exactly, Izzy. And this is where approaches like string theory and loop quantum gravity come in, attempting to weave together these incompatible threads. Points for creativity, but we still lack a testable, conclusive theory. Let's not forget that some of those creative theories have led us nowhere for decades. More philosophy than physics, if you ask me. I wouldn't be too quick to dismiss them, Mick. Theoretical progress can be slow and the issues are deep. We may just be impatient for a revolution similar to what Einstein sparked. Let's stay grounded. To me, these theories are like blind men groping an elephant. They may be onto something or they may be grasping at straws. What's frustrating is that we cannot currently prove it either way. Speaking of proof, without empirical evidence, are we chasing our own tails? How much credence can we give to theories that remain, for now, beyond the scope of experimental validation? I'll bite. None how. Science is empirical. Without testable predictions, a theory is just a fancy story. And boys, I love a good story, but not at a science roundtable. Hold on now. The development of these theories has had practical benefits, yielding new mathematical tools and concepts. We can't dismiss the indirect impact on other fields of physics. Mick. I appreciate your skepticism, but the pursuit of a unified theory isn't purely academic. We're talking about the fundamental laws that govern the universe. It's the holy grail of physics. And let's not be blind to the philosophical implications. A unified theory could fundamentally alter our conception of reality itself. The stakes are as high as they get. So we have a paradox of sorts. Two incredibly successful theories that describe their respective realms with incredible accuracy yet they can't shake hands. And in that handshake or lack thereof might lie the deepest secrets of the cosmos. We've discussed at length the scientific intricacies of relativity. Let's pivot to its broader cultural impacts. How do you see relativity influencing philosophy and our general worldview? Clearly, time dilation and the relativity of simultaneity have rocked our basic understanding of time. What philosophy assumed as absolute, relativity has shown to be subjective. That's a major shift in thinking. But let's not get carried away. Physics doesn't dictate ethics or meaning, merely mechanics. Philosophy and science operate in distinct domains. I must disagree, Mick. The philosophical impact is profound. Einstein's relativity bridges the gap between how we perceive reality and the actual workings of the universe, which redefines our place within it. That, I believe, is overstating it. The universe doesn't concern itself with our perception. Yes, relativity alters our framework, but cosmology doesn't rewrite philosophy. Lenny, we apply the scientific method in every analytical discipline. The shift relativity cause necessitates philosophical adaptation, to reconcile our notions of causality and the nature of existence. Philosophy adapts, sure, but does it really alter our daily lives? Technology influenced by relativity, now that's a tangible impact. You're missing the nuance, Jazz. It's not about daily routines, but about fundamental conceptions. Relativity affects our core understanding of reality itself, which invariably trickles down to technology, indeed, but also to our existential musings. Let me jump in here. Technological impacts, such as GPS, are a direct application, but it doesn't necessarily reshape our existential outlook, as Amelia suggests. Well, agreeing with Lenny for once, everyday technology can mask the underlying complexities. Relativity is transformative at a scientific level, yet it's so seamlessly integrated into technology that its philosophical heft is often unnoticed. But it's that seamless integration that demonstrates its philosophical breadth. Understanding the universe scientifically alters our approach to knowledge. That's epistemology interacting with physical theory. Maybe it alters academic epistemology, Izzy, but does it change the layperson's thinking? 
Science is, after all, a specialized field. But isn't there a feedback loop? Scientific advancements lead to new technologies, which then alter society, and as a result, shift our philosophical stance. Precisely. That loop is evident as we contend with the very nature of our universe, influence cosmological models, and inspire the next generation of theories. And yet, even as we discuss the merger of quantum mechanics with general relativity, much of the world remains unaffected by these grand philosophical revelations. That's a temporary state. The internet, AI, every breakthrough starts in a specialized field and eventually fundamentally changes how we live and think. Changes to everyday life, surely. To philosophical thought, the jury's out. The true test of relativity's influence on philosophy will be its staying power over the next centuries. Centuries of potential progress and debate, it's fascinating to consider where Einstein's legacy will take us. With that, let's collect our final thoughts. We've traveled through the curvature of space-time and emerged here at our endpoint. Though as we've discussed, in relativity, endpoints can be just the beginning. Let's start our final reflections. Amelia, your thoughts. This discussion has magnified how relativity continues to challenge our preconceptions. It's not just about physics, it's about the foundation of reality itself. And while those challenges are invigorating, we can't ignore the schism with quantum mechanics. We need a concord, yet after a century, it evades us. As much as I admire the search for unity, real physics is messy. Relativity isn't a neat little bow on top of our understanding, but a grappling hook that often tugs in unexpected directions. Jazz, that's precisely why our quest is so enthralling. The unpredictability of our universe, underscored by relativity, is what keeps us plunging into the depths of the cosmos, seeking answers. The notions we've parsed here have undeniably melded into the fabric of our technologies, too. Think about that next time your phone navigates you to a new spot. The practical doesn't diminish the speculative grandeur, though, Izzy. Speculation is the locomotive of physics. Surely, but we stand on a scaffold erected by giants. Einstein's legacy warrants thorough inspection, but not blind allegiance. Blind allegiance. Our reliance on empirical evidence is what prevents us from succumbing to that. Indeed, and our drive for empirical evidence keeps our field fiercely alive. As moderator, I haven't espoused my views, but I must say the passion here is palpable. Passion is the bedrock of discovery, Hal. Even in our heated moments, our fervor for understanding the cosmos binds us all. Very true. As we close, let's carry forward the relentless spirit of inquiry and Einstein's enduring legacy. And I thank you all for a spirited discussion. Our work continues, as does the march of time, relativistically speaking, of course.